good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Church service this morning. I'm glad to see who is here, but yes, good morning to everyone. Um, today is the second Sunday of Black History Month. And I would like to speak to you about my grandfather, Franklin Ward, and about what the various relationships were like in this country in the United States. In the South, where the largest open house spring training, African Americans were restricted to inferior advantages. Jim Crow laws kept the African Americans in perpetual social inferiorities and bound them to a social code imposed by the white classes. Lynchings were not uncommon, and African Americans faced threats of violence <coughs> on a regular basis. Even in Brooklyn, neighborhoods were largely divided along ethnic in 1940, Americans made up just 4% of Brooklyn's total excuse me, population. Thus, white Northerns viewed African Americans as unfamiliar at best and often as undesirable. While racism was still very present, the immigration movement had made some progress in the wake of World War II. America just had witnessed black and white soldiers fight together for the same cause. And this, when I talk about the 1940s, which was like, oh, you can understand why it relates to my grandfather. Regardless of the complex racial norms of the 1940s, my grandfather loved this country. He enlisted in the Army on December the 7th of 1942. He had an honorable discharge in 1944. You know how many of you know the Organization for American Legion? It was the nation's largest wartime veteran service organization aimed at advocating patriotism. Their motto is God, for God and country. I know in early in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, and maybe even today, this organization is made up of members of majority of white veterans. In 1947, with several other black veterans, my grandfather organized the American Legion by Simmons Post in number 1765 in Black Hawk, New York. They were issued a charter on October the 6th of 1949. He was elected post commander in 1958 and he held this position until 1961. In 1967, my grandfather was elected the first black commander of the Nassau County American Legion. And in 1991, he was elected the first black commander of the state of New York American Legion. He also held several national positions. My grandparents lived with me, with my family, my parents, and my brother and I. He was my hero. He loved me so much. And he should be taught my brother and I to love this country, to respect the American flag. Believe me, we, I can't all just say we had no choice, but but we knew, and we followed his example. And for that, I am very grateful. So I want to honor him today as part of the lecture stream. Thank you. Who love you 
And even though we do not see this as we look ahead, may we see it as we reflect. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations and under all circumstances for where two or three gather in your name, here you are. We thank you for your word that lives and abides forever and is a light along our pathway. Assure us that your way leads to light and that you are the companion of the journey. Meet us at the point of our needs and help us to bless others because of what you have given us. This we ask in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us now stand and sing our opening hymn number 728. Somebody is not going to be door. Thank you. 
moment when we should have spoken of them. Remind us that we love you and we must love one another as you taught us. Forgive us for our part in the inciting condition for the many peace without first practicing compassion. Forgive our lack of urgency to the lost, our apathy towards the least, and our indifference to the last. Help us instead to cut off barriers, restore dignity, heal, feed, and extend a loving hand. Give us courage to proclaim Jesus as the one in whom we hope, and for the sins of which we are not yet aware. Bring an awakening into our heart and mind that with greater humility we might together be fully yours. In the name of the divine love, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. At this point, let's take a moment of silence for peace. Lord, we pray for peace in this country. We pray for understanding in Washington. And as we look at what's happening on the Russian border, we pray that there is a peaceful solution to this problem. Thank you. 
whether to put food on the table or pay the rent. May their needs always be in our hearts, and may we satisfy this hunger through our resources and making changes in policies that benefit them. Lord, you said, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And we pray for those who are grieving, those who have lost loved ones, or dreams, or plans for their future. Hold them gently, we pray. Speak comfort to them, to us, and through us. Jesus, you said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We pray for those who are shamed, slandered, imprisoned, or executed for following your will and heeding your call. We pray for those around the world who, who cannot worship in safety and those who try to do what's right despite the odds. Teach us to prefer righteousness to comfort that we might see the world renewed. Jesus, you said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And we pray for the powerless, for those who go unseen and unheard, those trapped in systems of oppression and violence from which they cannot escape. Fill them with your promise of liberation and strength in a new world. Jesus, you said, blessed are the merciful. And we pray for those in, in power. May they choose mercy over silence. For revenge. Guide leaders in every place into the ways of your servant love. God, you said, blessed are the peacemakers. We pray for those who seek peace in this fractured world, bridge builders, mediators, those who seek reconciliation rather than shows of force. Multiply them until the whole world knows what it means to live without fear. Jesus, you taught us to pray and to listen to everyone who came to you with whatever pain or joy they had to share. We lift up our concerns for this day. We pray with Carol Chauncey for her friend Susan, who was just diagnosed with lung cancer. And we pray with Carol for Brian's health. We pray with Linda Pierce for her co-worker Georgina, whose husband died recently. We pray with Linda and her cousin Cheryl, who is facing a health concern. And we pray for Linda and Cheryl, her son's best friend, Titus, is grieving the death of both his parents, who just died in an automobile accident. We lift up continued prayers for Julius's uncle, Jojo, who has been given six months to live because of prostate and blood cancer. Continued prayers for Judy O'Brien, who is recuperating from both COVID and a broken leg. And we pray with Bill and Lee Lightfoot for Bill's brother, Abram, who has health concerns, and for continued prayers for both Bill and Winnie's good health. Are there other prayer requests from the congregation this day? I know it's been alluded to by Cordy, but I'd like to ask for extra prayer prayers today and in the week ahead for this situation in the Ukraine region that some people say is on the brink of war and I just hope that Putin will listen to reason and that diplomacy will help to solve the problems there. We pray for the conflict between Russia and the Ukraine that the peace may prevail. Yes. Yes. Special prayers today for Pam's sister Janet Moore. If you remember, we used to pray for her husband, whom she eventually lost about a year ago. And the grief is unbearable for her. I talk to her all the time. She's not getting any relief. But today is his birthday, and I know she's going. Pam's sister, Janet Moore, who's grieving very deeply the loss of her husband, and today this is will be his birthday. Yes, Lisa. Prayers for my supervisor, Tom, who fell in the and she will be on the way surgery tomorrow. Your name is Pam? Pam. We pray for Pam, this is co worker, or supervisor, who, who fell and broke her ankle and faces surgery tomorrow. Lord, we lift up all these prayers to you, and those prayers that are just taking shape.
shake in the recesses of our heart, but we know that you hear them, and we know that you understand us. So we lift it all to you, because you say that we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world, and we pray that you teach us to be your light in this world, to, to drive out shadows of despair and hurt, and light the way to your loving arms. For all these concerns of our hearts, we pray as you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of our Today's first lesson is Psalm for Psalm, Psalm 1. Listen to the word of God, to the response of the reading. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. But whose life is in the law of the Lord, and 
who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do, prospers. Not, not so the wicked. They are they're like right chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God.
our hearts and its meaning will be made apparent to us and what how you are calling for us to be and act and do in this world may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you because you are our rock and our redeemer amen, amen. okay who here considers themselves to be level-headed any level-headed people here Yes? No? <laughs> well, you know, you know what level head is. You be calm and sensible, reasonable, you know, thinking before you respond in any situation, uh, able to appreciate the pros and cons of the situation, able to take in different points of view. This is happening like you, maybe? Sometimes. Sometimes. Or there's someone who tries their level best to do the best they can given your circumstances, or to be on the level meaning that we're truthful and honest. Who here wants to be level-headed? Don't we? It's a good thing to have, to be. Um, and on the level with each other, right? Yes. So in the Bible, though, level can take on, takes on a different, deeper meaning. Now, of course, it's used dozens of times with just the, the ordinary understanding of level being the physical level plane, right? But there are other instances where level takes on a spiritual connotation. Level in the Bible often means being right with God, being in sync with God's ways. Thus we hear the psalmist declare to us that my foot stands on level ground, or ple pre pre um, pleading with God, because of my adversary, show me your way, lead me on that level path. The prophet Jeremiah describes it this way, that my people have forgotten me. They have left, they have left to walk in bypaths, in roads that are not smooth and not level. And of course, we all know and remember that famous messianic uh, pronouncement of Isaiah 40, of the voice that cries out, prepare the way of the Lord in the wilderness, make a level highway in the desert for our God, every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill made low, the uneven shall be made level, and the rough places a plain. And it is this famous passage that, that we hear John the Baptizer take up in Luke th chapter 3, and he refers to the coming of Jesus as the one who makes those crooked roads shall be made straight, and the one who the rough ways are smooth, and humanity will see all of God's salvation in Jesus. Today, Luke records for us, the very, for the first time, uh, the words of Jesus' teachings to his disciples and the crowds. And we know that Jesus has been traveling around and teaching and preaching, but these are the first time we actually hear his words being said. And the text tells us that Jesus stood on a level place. Jesus stood on a level place. Now, yes, maybe Jesus stood on the ground that was level as he talked. But I think looking deeper, we can see that Jesus also stood in that level place of God because he stood in the ways of, the, of God Almighty. Jesus is the one who straightens out the crooked ways of the people. Jesus smooths the rough places in the in people's lives. And Jesus is always on the level with us. He is forthright. He levels with us. And he tells us the real deal. It is his teachings that are the best, the truest, revealing in the clearest way possible the heart and the will of God. So Jesus teaches about four blessings and four woes or warnings. Blessings on the poor, the hungry, those who weep, those who are persecuted. And woes to those who are rich, well-fed, those who laugh, and those who are well-spoken of. It is a teaching, isn't it, of great reversal. Because of sin or simply of human condition, we often get things backwards, and Jesus has to set us straight. And Jesus, therefore, puts things on the level for us. Blessings and woes take on different meaning when we're living in the level. It is easy to believe that being rich, having plenty of food, being happy and 
well thought of as blessings. And in fact, there's a lot of scripture that points to them as a blessing. And we certainly, when we have these things, consider them blessings, do we not? Yes? But there's more going on. Jesus makes clear here that the biblical, uh, the biblical message that God is especially close to and cares for people who are poor, widows and orphans, the foreigner, those who struggle, those who are hungry or weeping or who are persecuted for living on the level. The scriptures repeatedly tell us that God hears the cry of the poor and the oppressed. He sees their misery and he cares. God desires for all his people to have good things, material and spiritual. But people who think they had it, had it made, they have all the things that money can buy, whose bellies are full for those for whom life may be a breeze and are well regarded according to the world's standards, they are brought to task, or we are brought to task by Jesus because there's more to life than material well-being. But all are deserving of material well-being. If that is all life is about to us, making money, being held in esteem, having a good time, then well, Jesus is leveling with us. We have failed and we allowed our paths to go crooked. And Jesus wants us on that right path. The level space where issues of sin, inequality, love, peace, and justice matter. My blessings should become blessings for others. My riches can help alleviate the situation of the destitute. My access to good food and clean water can help others have access to food and water. My happiness should not shut out those who are grieving. My good status in the world does not turn its back on the persecuted. And Jesus, out of love for all of us, levels this playing field where all have fair access to the necessities of life. And that Christians, rich or poor alike, are called to live on the level. At the last meeting of the Presbytery of Long Island on January 29th, we spent a great deal of time talking about an overture to the General Assembly, which is meeting this uh, June in Louisville, Kentucky. The approved amendment, or the recommendation that finally came about was this. As a beginning step in the quest for truth, equity, justice, reconciliation, and repair, the Presbytery of Long Island overtures the 225th General Assembly to offer an apology to African Americans for the sin of slavery and its legacy. The purpose of this overture is an act to get us to live on the level as a church. Because you see, as a Presbytery, we recognize that the very first Presbytery organized in 1705 was by an enslaver named Reverend Francis McKee. In 1740, Samuel Davies, an enslaver and educator, believed that slavery was ordained by God. The renowned Presbyterian evangelist Charles Finney spoke out against slavery despite believing African Americans were inferior and he, and he was opposed to integration. The General Assembly of 1836 accepted the argument that slavery was recognized in the Bible. And there were others who opposed slavery, like Reverend Jacob Green on the eve of the Revolution, um, Revolutionary War in 1776, and like Reverend George Byrne, who in 1815 presented an overture to the General Assembly, raising the question, can you be Presbyterian and own slaves? Can you be Christian and own slaves? The assembly refused to act. And upon his return to his presbytery in Harrisonburg, Pennsylvania, they voted him to defrock him, to remove him from ministry. And in 1858, on the eve of the Civil War, the United Presbyterian Church of North America was formed. It's one of our uh, forerunners of the 
prior to our current denomination, it was formed with, with opposition to slavery as one of its founding tenets. So you see, doesn't it look like our church is historically mere good and bad of society? But if we want to live on Jesus' level, we got to do better than that. We have to need to actively transcend and transform culture. Jesus calls us to pursue God's level in all matters that is mediated to us through the scriptures, clarified to us through Jesus' examples of healings and his teachings, and through the work of the Holy Spirit in our midst. So this overture that our Presbytery is making to the General Assembly is an attempt for us to get us to live on the level of Jesus Christ. During Black History Month, we have the opportunity, and we are taking that opportunity to deepen our awareness of the sin of slavery and its legacy that lives on and even to our day, as well as celebrate the contributions of African Americans to the country, to the world. So we are called to straighten out the highways, to repair those roads, and to level the circumstances we find ourselves in through the lens of faith. So let us be levelers in the manner of Jesus. Let us stand on the level plane. And may God's level bless our acts of leveling in the world. And may we be blessed through the grace of God as we strive to make that level for all people in all walks of life. Amen. 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 <clears throat>
friends like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Many 
they started looking at trying to replace the gloves. They had been here so long, they weren't making them anymore. Go to buy gloves. And Patrick Coley, this guy doesn't give up. <laughs> Get his claws into something, he doesn't give up. But we have light. And we have to thank Patrick Coley for that. Because he spent a lot of time trying to dump bugs all along in order to have the light here. So thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, much appreciated. Uh, well, tomorrow, you know, we, it's Valentine's Day, and uh, there's no way we could miss that. Because if you will be as men to forget, we will be reminded. So, tomorrow is Valentine's Day. I would also like to extend a um, happy birthday to Emily Coe, also who's on Wednesday, February the 16th. Also a happy birthday to Shannon Stenzel, who's on next um, Sunday, February the 20th. Um, we're also looking at a uh, session of First Presbyterian Church of Freeport, and I think I'll make the announcement that there is going to be a meeting because we have to do that. My memory serves me right two consecutive Sundays before that Sunday. So, the session of First Presbyterian Church of Freeport, New York, calls the congregation in its ecclesiastical and corporate capacities on Sunday, February 27, 2022, at 5 p.m. via Zoom. The purpose of the meeting is to present the budget for 2022, review committee reports, the election of new church officers, and any business that is brought before from the congregation. And let us bear in mind, for this to happen, we have to have four of members. So, we make the announcement today, and we make it again next week. Then we go into the 27th and have that meeting. Um, I don't know if there is any other. Um, Glenn, do you have anything for us? I mean? Uh, no, it's just that uh, the, the annual, annual report will be sent via email. Uh, anybody who comes here to, this week and next Sunday will, will, will get a hard copy. But it'll, it'll be available for you to download to your computer, print out whenever you want it, and use it for reference. Also, it's Super Bowl Sunday. Super S O U P E R. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Glenn. And, um, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, next Patrick. week. Next week, of course, is the Pastor Rob. Okay. So, everybody will be getting an email about that. Okay, thank you, Glenn. That'll be better. I almost missed that. Um, and next week, um, your little chest will be found similar. If there's no other announcement, yes. Um, yes. We have a request. Yes, sure. Um, can we play those? Uh, the was it praise his holy name? Like sounds like that every Sunday. I think <laughs> more people into the church. We can, but I just want to mention that we are moving into Lent shortly, so, you know, it's, it's a reflective period, so, but we have a little bit more. But it's very joyous and uplifting. Okay. okay. I think George would find a very upbeat version of the Old Roman Cross. He's <laughs> that <laughs> With that being said, let us stand and sing our closing hymn, number 339, lift every voice and sing. <clears throat>
always, and God's people.